Welcome. Welcome to New England Authors. It's so good to have you. Uh, we have uh, different shows all the time pr presenting different subjects, and we'd like to focus more on our changing environment, our changing planet, on uh, climate change, of course. And uh, we have with us today uh, our wonderful guest, Dr. Sam Myers. Welcome to the show, Dr. Dr. Myers. Thank you. And Dr. Myers is a physician and principal research uh, scientist at the Harvard T.H. Uh, Chan School of Public Health and director of Planetary Health Alliance at the Harvard University. We're at Harvard University right now, uh, Center for the Environment, that's where we are, and instructor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School. So um, your, your work intersects human health, personal health as a physician, and also the global environmental health. Can you tell us briefly how you got to this uh, research that you're doing personally and professionally? Sure. Um, well, so, so my interest in um, the sort of human health impacts of global environmental change goes back to you know, high school and college when I was uh, very sort of intrigued with how human activity was increasingly really disrupting and transforming um, the state of most of our natural systems and sort of wondering what does that mean for our own health and well-being and, and what do those connections look like? And um, I've been sort of pursuing this very nonlinear path with that overarching question ever since. Um, so I went to medical school, went to a residency in internal medicine, spent um, two years in Tibet uh, as a field manager of an integrated health and conservation project, uh, worked in the field for six years sort of as a practitioner at the intersection of natural resource management and health, um, and ultimately felt that uh, there was a real need for um, a field focused on understanding the health dimensions of um, global environmental change, and that one of the things that was kind of holding that field back was a lack of evidence uh, mm -hmm. that it needed a sort of robust kind of research basis um, for a field to get launched. And so I came back to Harvard and did my clinical uh, research fellowship and my master's of public health, and um, then set about um, beginning uh, to do research. And the first thing um, that I did, and it was a luxury, was uh, to write a review paper for the annual reviews on um, the human health impacts of global environmental change. And so in that process, I had the opportunity to review you know, hundreds of papers about you know, different dimensions of uh, environmental change and human health connections, you know, impacts on infectious diseases and mental health and displacement and nutrition. And in that process, um, sort of stumbled on uh, what was a sort of esoteric literature about uh, how rising carbon dioxide levels might impact uh, the nutrient profile of staple food crops. And it was uh, a contested literature because um, you know a handful of experiments had been done, uh, usually in artificial conditions in greenhouses and chambers um, with quite small sample sizes, so they lacked statistical power yeah. um, to have significance. But what they seemed to show was that when you grow crops at elevated carbon dioxide levels, they lose nutrients like iron and zinc and protein. And as a physician, I know that those are really important nutrients right. to global health and that we have you know, on the order of two billion people around the world who are already suffering from deficiencies of those nutrients in their diets. And so if it were true that our putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere was impoverishing our food supply with respect to those nutrients, that would be a big deal for public health. And so I was interested in trying to um, resolve that question. Now, you wrote a, a Keystone article here in The Lancet called uh, Sca Safeguarding Human Health in the Anthropocene Epoch. And the Anthropocene basically means the age of humans. Uh, and so it's a, a report about the planetary health. And uh, you outline uh, this, what you were calling zinc, iron, and protein uh, deficiencies. Uh, how did you conduct this experiment? 
Okay, well, let me just make a, a distinction because um, that paper uh, in 2015, Safeguarding Human Health in the Anthropocene, um, was the report of the Rockefeller Lancet Commission on Planetary Health. And so that's really about the broad topic of planetary health, which right. I'll, I'll maybe come back to in just a okay. minute. But in 2014, the year before that, we wrote a paper in the journal Nature um, in which we essentially reported the results of five years of research on the effect of rising carbon dioxide levels on crop nutrients. And so what we did to answer this question about whether rising CO2 might be um, affecting our food supply was to build a coalition of um, agronomists and plant physiologists and nutritional epidemiologists um, who were engaged in what had become the gold standard for evaluating questions of CO2 and plants. And that gold standard is called FACE, or Free Air Carbon Dioxide Enrichment. Mm -hmm. And so in these experiments, uh, you're essentially growing crops not in chambers or greenhouses, but in open field conditions like any field you've seen, mm -hmm. um, where you have a ring of carbon dioxide emitting jets. And in the center of the ring is a wind uh, direction sensor. And you can maintain the carbon dioxide level inside the ring at a prescribed level. In the case of our experiments, it was 550 parts per million, which is where we expect the world to be about the middle of this century. Right. Uh, and then the crops that are inside the ring are identical to the crops that are outside the ring with respect to you know, soil conditions and weather and pests and pathogens. And the only way that they're different is that they're being grown at higher CO2 concentrations. And then when you're done, you harvest them and you compare the nutrient profiles. And so we conducted those experiments on 41 cultivars of six staple food crops, things like wheat and rice and soy and maize and sorghum. Um, so on six staple food crops, 41 cultivars, on seven locations on three continents over 10 years, which gave us a much, much larger sample size, which gave us, gave us the statistical power to resolve this question. And that was the paper that we published in Nature in 2014, which showed that yes, indeed, when you grow staple food crops at elevated carbon dioxide, they're less nutritious. They lose really important nutrients like iron and zinc and protein. Now, the next question is sort of, so what? So mm -hmm. what does that mean for global health? Yeah. So if plants are losing their nutrients, how many of us are at risk for nutrient deficiencies? And that question can't really be answered without knowing what people are eating. Because if you're eating tons of iron or tons of zinc, then a small reduction in the amount of zinc in certain food crops won't matter to you. But if you're kind of close to the threshold or you're already deficient, and you're depending on those staple food crops for your iron and zinc, well, then that's a big deal. And so how many people fit into that latter category? And it turns out that to answer that question, we had to build an entirely new database called the Global Expanded Nutrient Supply Database, mm -hmm. which estimates the per capita intake for um, 250 different foods across the populations of 152 different countries with the nutrient density for each one of those foods of 23 different nutrients by age and sex. And that's called the genus database. And then we use that to model how this CO2 mediated nutrient loss would affect those populations of 152 countries. And so for the last several years, we've written a series of papers looking at risk of deficiency of iron and zinc and protein from rising CO2. And we brought all of that together in a synthesis paper in Nature Climate Change last September. And essentially what we found is that our addition of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere is putting hundreds of millions of people at risk for new deficiencies of those nutrients in addition to exacerbating the existing deficiency in you know billions of people and so it's a, it's a very significant um, global health threat so this was a surprise to you that um, uh, co2 you would think plants love co2 right they 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 eat um, carbon dioxide as we eat oxygen that their increased uh, level would would give them better uh, uh, produce, no? Yeah, so well, I was surprised. So, so 
we're talking about the nutrient content. We're not talking about the yield. So there, in fact, is a small, what's called a CO2 fertilization effect, in which if you add carbon dioxide, plants tend to grow a little bit faster. That um, fertilization effect was kind of overstated in the 90s, and subsequent experiments have shown that maybe it's on the order of about 10%. But what we didn't know when those experiments were being conducted is that your yield might go up a little bit with CO2, but the nutrient profile goes down. And essentially what you're doing is exchanging uh, protein and micronutrients for starch, uh, for carbohydrate. So um, can you uh, tell us uh, what is planetary health and how does it differ from climate change? Yeah, so um, this whole field that I've been talking about of global environmental change, um, climate change is a piece of that. Um, you know, I was thinking about it actually uh, this morning. I was trying to think, you know, what's an analogy? And I started thinking about Hercules fighting Medusa. And I was thinking, you know, you've got this multi-headed monster. Yeah. And he can't actually fight the monster without a mirror. And I actually am I'm now kind of fascinated by this. I want to look into it more because... I think that's exactly the situation we're in. Climate change is one aspect of this really sort of outsized ecological footprint that humanity has now assumed. As a result of population growth and our consumption patterns, the scale of the human enterprise in the last 50 years has become so large that it outstrips our planet's capacity to you know, absorb our wastes or to provide the resources that we need sustainably. And as a result, we're transforming all of our natural systems. So we're definitely transforming the climate system, mm -hmm. but also you know, biodiversity loss. We heard two weeks ago that you know, about a million species are you know, facing extinction, some within decades. Yeah. Um, resource scarcity of things like water and arable land, global pollution of air, water, and soil, changes in biogeochemical cycles. So there are all these ways that we're transforming our natural systems, and they all interact with each other in complex ways to affect the sort of core conditions of human health, the, the quality of air that we breathe, the quality and quantity of food that we can produce, our exposure to infectious diseases, our exposure to natural hazards, and ultimately affect every dimension of health. And so that is the field of planetary health. The climate conversation and the health impacts of climate change is kind of one of the heads of the Medusa, mm -hmm. that you can't fight that multi-headed monster, and maybe one head is climate and one is biodiversity loss and one is resource scarcity. You can't fight it without looking in a mirror because fundamentally the problem is us. Right? It's, it's not some existential threat of a meteor coming down to hit the planet. It's our own, the scale of our own activities, the way we're living, what our energy system looks like, what our manufacturing system looks like, what our chemical industry looks like, what our urban design looks like. And so the solutions are all within us as well, but we need to look in the mirror. Thank you. This is um, New England Authors. We're speaking with Dr. Sam Meyer. So I want to ask now, um, you, we were talking about uh, the zinc, iron, and protein deficiency. What are the health risks for that? And who are the people that are most vulnerable? Yeah, so um, the health risks are, uh, you know, so they're different for each one of them. So zinc um, is an important uh, micronutrient for the infectious disease and for the functioning of our immune system. And mm -hmm. so all the burden of disease associated with zinc deficiency is from childhood mortality from infectious diseases. And so when we've done zinc repletion studies where we take populations of kids and we give them extra zinc, they die at much lower rates uh. from things like pneumonia and malaria right. and diarrhea. And so zinc is really important to protect us from infectious disease. Iron is important for a whole variety yes. of reasons. Yes. Um, and so iron deficiency um, leads to increased maternal mortality, meaning women giving uh, mm -hmm. birth or, or just closely after birth have higher rates of mortality. Infants born to those women have higher rates of mortality. 
Um, adults with iron deficiency get anemia and they have lower work capacity. It also affects um, IQ and cognition uh, in development and ultimately leads to um, wasting and higher rates of mortality in kids. So it's mm -hmm. sort of multifactorial. And protein is similar that it leads to um, wasting and stunting in children if you have protein deficiency and ultimately higher mortality rates. So, you know, a lot of disease and death essentially yes. from those deficiencies. Yes. Um, in terms of who's at risk, um, you know, this is one of the kind of um, recurrent themes of planetary health is that in many instances, those of us who are most responsible for the environmental transformations that are occurring are the least affected mm -hmm. um, by the health impacts of those transformations. And we actually just submitted a paper where we quantified that in the case of CO2 and nutrition, that the people who are going to emit the carbon dioxide between now and 550 parts per million, which is what we were modeling, mm -hmm. are almost entirely different as a, as a global population than the people who are at risk for the nutritional impacts and the health impacts of that. The people who are at risk tend to be poor, have less diverse diets, live in Africa and South Asia have less animal source food in their diet, which tends to be richer in iron and zinc and protein, um, but they also just have less diverse diets in general. And so they're much closer to deficiency already or already experienced deficiency. Whereas the people that are emitting the carbon dioxide are wealthier populations, you know, primarily in places like the United States or wealthy parts of Europe, China, India, um, who have diverse diets and therefore are not at, at such high risk. So you see this sort of disconnect between the people who are driving the threat and the yeah. people who are paying the, the cost. The actual life support systems underneath us are starting to crumble. And that all of those kinds of interventions are fine, but we're, we're doing them on the Titanic. We're doing them mm -hmm. at a time mm -hmm. when the core life support systems that we rely on are crumbling. And we need to go even further upstream, and we need to understand that how we take care of our planet's natural systems is fundamental to the health of future generations. And so in many ways, I've sort of, that's been my personal journey of just continuing to go upstream. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think you see that when you're uh, in lower income countries, um, that people are living uh, in a way that's much um, more affected by changes in natural systems. Yeah. They're, you know, they're affected if fisheries start to fail or climate shocks are affecting their crops or more extreme weather events are you know, causing their villages to be flooded. Um, and so you certainly see it in more um, stark terms. And you also see that you know, these are the populations around the world that have the, you know, very few resources to um, sort of insulate them or protect them from these kinds of large-scale environmental change. And so there's an enormous sort of vulnerable population out there in the world, numbered probably in the billions, um, who we need to be thinking about around our own consumption practices and um, how we're going to avoid putting all of those people in harm's way. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more what you're, you're doing in, in these uh, poorer countries? Well, so in Madagascar, um, I've been working with a, a former postdoc and now a colleague, Chris Golden, um, who spent 17 years back and forth to Madagascar. And um, we created a project um, in a protected area in two villages in the Makira protected area in northeast Madagascar. And um, what we were trying to understand there was the relationship between the health of those communities and the health of the natural systems in this you know, really pristine protected area. And in particular, we were trying to understand their reliance on um, wild harvested um, bushmeat and then later um, coastal communities looking at their reliance on wild harvested fish. Um, and the question was really, um, about this sort of perceived conflict between people and um, animals or, or nature. And um, we, you know, there, there are spectacular biodiversity in Madagascar, and including things like lemurs that are um, rare, that are threatened, 
and that have long life cycles and can't really withstand much predation um, without seeing their numbers dwindle mm -hmm. quite mm -hmm. quickly. And we were interested in whether that sort of conflict could be resolved by really understanding the population dynamics of the wildlife. And so we wanted to quantify how important is it for these villagers to be eating, you know, bush meat, to be eating, you know, captured wildlife for their own health. And the first thing that we found was it was hugely important that in fact we modeled what a ban on wildlife hunting would do for these villagers. And we saw that it would increase their anemia rates by 30% in, in children, which is a huge hit in terms of public health. Yeah. But then we actually did a lot of population dynamics of the wildlife, and we're now in the process of, of analyzing that data to show that it's true that the you really need to stop hunting the lemurs if, if the lemur populations are gonna be able to be healthy. Yeah. But there are other mammals like tenrex, which is you know one of the most sort of prolific uh, mammals in the world, it's sort of a rodent-like uh, mammal right. that can be consumed and hunted, and they're just very very robust populations. And so what we're trying to do is rather than making it a black and white question of people versus mm -hmm. nature, is how do we manage this so we protect the wildlife but also maintain these really critical sources of nutrients for the people. And we're doing something similar with, with coastal communities um, in Madagascar looking at fisheries and are there you know, marine protected areas or different kinds of fisheries management approaches that would allow people to access fish in their diet while also protecting sort of sustainable fish populations. And as I say, that work is really being led um, by my uh, colleague, Chris Golden. So mm -hmm. um, he should get most of the credit for it, mm -hmm. but that's work that I've been involved in with him. So uh, are you advocating um, uh, policy changes on the governmental level? We have, I mean, we have, and we've, we've worked from the beginning, and this is a common theme in planetary health, is that um, we tend to try to bring policymakers into the research before we even get started to understand, you know, what are the questions that they need answered that are yeah. sort of policy relevant. Um, and we've done that on a lot of projects. And in this case, we've worked closely with um, uh, officials in Madagascar and then uh, can make recommendations about, you know, ways to enforce uh, wildlife um, restrictions, for example, that would be most effective in kind of optimizing the health of the wildlife, but also the health of the local populations. Mm -hmm. This is a New England authors, if, you, if you're just joining us and we're talking with Dr. Sam Myers. Um, so would you, uh, so uh, we live in this interconnected world, but many of us seem to think that this is not the case, especially in America, land of uh, individualism. Uh, would you care to expound on um, how to overcome this and how to deal with climate deniers? You know, one of the things about our CO2 and nutrition research is that you can be a climate denier all you want, but you can't deny the instrumental record of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I mean, we just go out and measure it, and we know that it's been rising, and it's been rising ever since, you know, Ralph Keeling started measuring it in Hawaii in mm -hmm. the 50s. And um, before that, if you look at ice core data, and um, so there's nothing to debate about the instrumental record of carbon dioxide. And our work is simply showing that that trajectory of rising CO2 is gonna affect, you know, hundreds of millions of people in terms of their nutritional status and independent of any climate effect. So even if you're a climate denier, you probably need to accept that, you know, adding all of that carbon dioxide is problematic in terms of global nutrition. It's also problematic in terms of ocean acidification and what's happening to, you know, coral reefs and to crustaceans, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there are other ways to think about it, but I also think fundamentally, um, that debate is shifting. And yeah. I think that, you know, being a climate denier is, um, is an increasingly sort of losing proposition and uh, certainly not one that, you know, I think anyone would want to defend to their children or their grandchildren. So um, hopefully that's, that's gonna just keep, keep changing. So uh, Dr. Sam Meyer, do you think that um, educating uh, uh, Americans about planetary health can really uh, help us become more informed and take care of the planet better? Yes. Um, I think that uh, we're in a really sort of important 
and kind of unique moment in human history where we're coming to understand that um, the scale of our activities and the way we're living is actually putting ourselves and in particular future generations in peril. That level of cultural transformation cannot be um, sort of instituted from the top down. It needs to come up from the people. And so I actually think the most important thing to achieving planetary health is an activated global constituency of people that yeah. understand the urgency of these issues and demand that their governments are taking action, demand that you know businesses are providing products that meet their needs, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, the role of awareness building, of helping people simply understand the issues is absolutely critical. So programs like this and, and others that are uh, raising awareness about this moment that we're in and about the challenges of planetary health and helping people understand that they actually are the critical step. They, you know, coming together and taking collective action and demanding that we do something about these challenges. And there, there, there's so many things that we can do. I mean, we, we know um, what to do, mm. but we need the political will to take that action. And that doesn't come until people, you know, are really educated and understand the issues. Thank you.